Welcome to the Book of Mormon Evidence podcast with host Rod Meldrum. This week's Come Follow Me supplemental study is Lesson 19, Mosiah chapters 18 through 24. We have entered into a covenant with him. This is part two in Amberly's presentation on ancient sacred Jewish symbology in the Book of Mormon. So, okay, so going yeah. to uh, one of the next ones. Now, this is yeah. one of my favorite ones. Okay. <laughs> okay. Where are we going? <laughs> um, this, now, now, now uh, Wayne May and I, um, were, were for a number of years, we take uh, people to go see one of the most astounding sites in all of the Hopewell culture, um, you know, interaction sphere, basically, which is in, in Newark, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a place, that's, it's called the, the Great Octagon and the Great Circle. At, Collectively called the, New, the the Newark Earthworks, basically, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, and we would take people out there. And we would show them these amazing works, and they had the ditches, and they had these earth banks, and everything. We talk all about how they, they had these amazing like circles and squares and and octagons and and ro- and it, you know roads or, or paths between these places and so forth. And we thought it was it, it was just wonderful. And then you came along. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> and now, 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 a little bit of understanding. With Amberly's understanding of, of Hebrew symbolism, she began to come to a realization. Oh, let me give you the page. It's page 250. Okay. This is from the, uh, again, the annotated edition of the Book of Mormon, page 250. And, uh, and, and what I want to, uh, to bring out here is the fact that because of their having the brass plates and because of their, um, you know, living these laws of Moses and so forth, they understood things that uh, that really no other religion one of the things that separates the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints from really any other religion is our understanding of the purpose of life and nice. how this all goes down yep. you know how this all plays out and that's all called the plan of salvation yep. and in the book of mormon he actually talks about this and this is from uh, it's from alma and this is uh, let's see chapter 24 and uh, and this is uh, let's see go to verse uh, 14 so alma 24:14 it says and the great and the great god has had mercy on us and made these things known unto us that we might not perish yea and he has made these things known unto us beforehand because he loveth our souls as well as he loveth our children therefore in his mercy he doth visit, visit us by his angels that the plan of salvation might be made known unto us as well as unto future generations. Mm-hmm. So what does that tell us? It tells us that, number one, they knew the plan of salvation mm-hmm. and they wanted it preserved yep. for their future generations. And how would you go about doing that? I mean, you could write about it. Obviously, they had it written down someplace. Mm-hmm. But they built it into the land that still sits to this day all these years later. Because these mounds, and what people need to understand on an archaeological level, is they're not just mounded up dirt. They are engineered, just ingeniously engineered, so that they could stand the test of time. Because they did want this kept. They want it encoded in the land. And so this is basically an outdoor temple complex. In fact, it's the largest temple complex in the world even to mm-hmm. this day it's over four square miles yes. in extent there is no other temple by any other religion that is more than that, that is bigger than four square miles yep. in extent but that's how huge this thing is this was the monumental effort to do this and yes. it would have taken thousands of people uh, many years probably to do this yes. this work yes. but the thing that's so interesting is it has encoded in it um, several different geometric mm-hmm. figures. And I'd like yes. to have you, hey. kind of, if you would, yes. just give us a quick overview. Now, there's going to be a lot more in-depth yeah. information. Yeah. Um, you know, this, this, the book just has just a little mm-hmm. quick uh, thing there. But, well, uh, but you have this, you've explained this on yes. some of your talks yes. before. Mm-hmm. And those I'm are actually going to produce, side. yes, and then yeah. I'm actually going to produce an actual DVD this, this spring of just this. So you, if you wanted mm-hmm. just this, it'll be available. So that's kind of great. Wonderful. But what I will say about this is we as members of the church who have, have been through a temple, you know, in our LDS culture and religion, we know that uh, originally we would move from room to room. We would literally learn something in one room and then we would stand up and progress into a new another room and there'd be greater light and you'd sometimes ascend literally like up a few steps or to give this idea and convey these ideas of moving into greater light and knowledge and understanding but you'd physically literally move well what we have here in this temple complex is uh, uh, the ability for a great number of people to experience and learn this plan of salvation by moving from not just room to room but these amazing works 
and I'll, we'll start like kind of like with this with this first one here, the this circle, mm-hmm. and that they could be taught and then move to the next phase of understanding and and you know go through kind of like we did and and so what we find here as I studied it and looked at this and began to research how these were made for example the the striking so what, so what does the circle yes represent the, symbolically? Well, well symbolically you know at first it just looks like a circle but then as I learned that the moat you know wasn't a defensive you know in, in, in a defensive uh, earth mound or whatever you're the moats on the outside to yeah. prevent Right. attack right. but this one the so moat the <laughs> lined the inside and it was full of water but the but the the place where the water actually was inside that moat was painted gold so we have this 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 beautiful gold water if you will but this this water that and, and, what, and what wasn't it wasn't like paint like you would have paint right. it was actually they had to go miles and miles away yes. find a particular kind of soil yep. that was actually a yellowish goldish mm-hmm. color mm-hmm. and they would have to they then you know, get that soil yep. and then haul it all the way over here so they could line the inside of this mm-hmm. thing which by the way just the circular part of this thing is just huge huge it is huge. i mean it's uh, it, it, it's you know just to haul enough uh, enough soil to to cover just a little small portion of it would be just a pretty monumental monumental effort. absolutely so it, in other words it, they were very vested in wanting to make sure that happened it was yes. very important for them to do that they were willing to go to that work yeah. and why because what i believe they're creating and as you look at this map as i studied this map and studied how it was made and in the the history of it and mm-hmm. as far as the archaeology of it it occurred to me as i'm looking at that that perhaps wow it looks a lot like a womb when you look at it, it mm-hmm. it, it looks like a human, uh, you know, a, a womb well, inside I've a woman. I've actually had Native Americans mm-hmm. that, who have uh, who have oh, verified, verified that. Mm-hmm. this and said, you know, that this is that that, that what is to represent. If you if, if you take a close look at it, basically it's it's round, but it has kind of a interesting. Where it comes up, there's an entrance area mm-hmm. that comes up, and uh, and basically um, that was an, the the entrance area there, mm-hmm. and then it comes in, and then on the inside of this thing was a structure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Tell about the structure. Yeah. So yeah. So that structure, and well, I'll let you talk about more about that yeah, briefly, okay. and then we'll talk about yeah. more of the. Yeah, and, and just a couple other things, just kind of on, from the more macro scale yeah. of this thing. Essentially, what you have, if you can, and, and I'm trying to describe this because some of you are listening to this on podcast, and so you can't you can't see what we're saying. So, essentially, when we look at a book, for example, our eyes immediately go up to the upper left hand corner because we read from left to right. But Hebrew is written the opposite direction. So they would go to the upper right-hand corner, and they tend to read in a counterclockwise rotation mm-hmm. or look at things in a counterclockwise rotation, whereas we look at things typically in a more of a clockwise rotation. This entire earthwork basically is set up in a counterclockwise rotation, beginning with the circular portion. Mm-hmm. Um, the circular portion then uh, has, has uh, where, where the entrance is, it leads out into... Uh, there's there's like um, two containment walls, if you will, as you come out, so you can't really leave that. And it's like direction a tunnel in a particular, or a, a tunnel. Like a tunnel going into a direction there. Mm-hmm. And then that leads to another um, massive earthwork, which is in a square, square. Mm-hmm. configuration. Mm-hmm. Yep. What does a square represent? Yep. So, yeah, so let's talk about that. So typically in symbology, so round... Uh, anything around circular represents heaven and things from on high divine and square is represent the earth the four corners of the earth earth square like native and, americans then they're and they're they're, yes. uh, they're the four cardinal the directions wheel, the, the yes so so basically yeah. what that's conveying to me and and things on a symbolic level of course are always very you know um subjective and and whatnot so there's no yes right you know exactly right and wrong these are suggestions that i'm going to give that came to my mind and i've mm-hmm. added them here but so this Which, by the way i think you're right <laughs> <laughs> so we have this circle here and, and you could say that it represents birth and uh being born here right and that that once we are born we come down you know we progress into yeah. down to earth you know here we are the scriptures as, often as, talk as, about yeah. the four corners of the earth yes. and that's the representation of that and that and so geometrically speaking yep. that's how you would that's, represent, you would represent the earth, earth in four corners by a absolutely. square okay. absolutely or a re- it could be a rectangle yeah true but most four corners yes four corners to represent the four cardinal directions and uh so he we come here and then we get into this square as you see here and then um uh, representing earth life but but it, it's more than just that because like we said we, with the gospel of Christ is laid out very specifically in throughout the Book of Mormon but there's very specific steps and so we talk about the earth life being um, 
uh, you know, you come here and then at that point you, you've entered into the, into the gates, if you will. And then now you, that's where, uh, baptism. Okay. So then you, when you're, you know, born after, after eight years or whenever you, you become baptized and then, but are you done? Are you there? Have you, have you made it? No, you then must press forward with a steadfastness in, in faith. And so at that point you then, Begin your your journey, if you will, so to speak, and you and we see this 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 now at this point you're walking this path. Uh, you see on the map if you're able to to watch this, and so there becomes this yeah. this path, if you will, that is uh, on the on the uh, on the side of the path. There's this great uh, pond. Now on this map, it's a lot smaller, but at the time I learned this was pond big. was ginormous, yeah. so it was quite much bigger than this. Yeah. Um, with time, it's short, and by the but. way, the map that we are referring to is a map yep. that was done by an ancient monuments of Mississippi River Valley. This is back in 1848, 1848. by Squire and Davis. Yep. It's one of the earliest mm-hmm. maps. Other maps were done of this. Actually, was uh, it was actually surveyed about three different times. Mm-hmm. Um, one of those was uh, by David Wyrick back in 1860. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was the town surveyor of this, and so there there are several different maps, and, and they don't yeah. all agree 100. percent But the but all of the major elements are there. Yes, yes. So if you picture a great big huge pond, and the, the thing that marks a pond from that distinguishes a pond from other types of water is a pond is stagnant water, mm-hmm. right? It's it's not it's not being there's no inlet or outlet with a, with a pond. Right. And so what happens with a pond? If you're going to represent filthy water, if you're going to talk about Nephi's or Lehi's dream and vision and Nephi's, you know, and the interpretation mm-hmm. that Nephi was given, you're going to think, you know, filthy water mm-hmm. that in this life as you're walking the path that he talked about with the, with the, the rod of iron, that there's this filthy water that's very close to this. Which this would path. also probably explain why Christ was not baptized in the beautiful clear waters of the Sea of Galilee, which I've swam in. I think you probably have too. Yep, yep, <laughs> so yep, yep. But, um, but instead, he, he, he chose to be baptized in the muddy yeah. River Jordan. Yeah. I, and I, I remember as a kid, why would you, why would living you water. do that? Living water. Because it has to be flowing, yep, yep. which is representing living, living yep. water, yep. moving yep. living yep. water. Yeah, because still stagnant water becomes very dirty very quickly, mm-hmm. very filthy. Mm-hmm. So we were, you know, in my mind, this is what's, what we're seeing here represented by what it, the, on the map looks small, but at the time was this huge pond of, of stagnant water. And then you, as you progress and you, the idea being to stay out of that pond of that filthy water and <laughs> to, stay, to stay on the path. <laughs> and we think about Nephi, but to stay on that path, it's, that's, that's, you know, straight and narrow, very narrow, as you can see. Mm-hmm. And then as you progress, you end up here at uh, what's called the Great Octagon. And that's a fascinating work because it is so mathematically and astronomically aligned. It's unbelievable. In fact, the measurements that they were able to figure out that the, he, they who built it, the architects of this, this earthwork, used the same measurements that were used to build the uh, pyramids in the Egypt. Pyramid I mean, Giza. yes. So the mathematical understanding which, which that is, is phenomenal. Which is 606 feet. Yes. And then that 606 feet, basically, if you, if you double that, basically it creates a square. And if you take that square and you rotate it, then it causes an eight-pointed mm. side. And then each, if you t- tie each one of those up, then you create an octagon. Yep. Those of you who have ever had the opportunity to go to the Salt Lake Temple mm-hmm. or to the San Diego Temple, um, the Salt Lake Temple, as you walk up to the front entry doors, there is a, a little symbol there that's emblazoned on the door. So it's basically mm-hmm. a little square piece of glass, second little piece of glass, and it's rotated mm-hmm. about uh, 45 degrees. And on that, it's a little beehive. Mm-hmm. If you connected all the tips of all eight of those little square, you know, the tips mm-hmm. of the squares, it would create an octagon. Yep. What is that symbol called? The seal of Melchizedek. Are you talking about that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So Hugh Nibley talks which, about this. Which is all over on the uh, San Diego Temple as well, over 10,000 yes. 10, times. 10,000 times. If you look straight down on the San Diego yeah. Temple, it actually it, it creates yes. A, yes. a seal of it's Melchizedek. In, it's in the fence. It's, in the, it's imprinted in, in the cement surrounding mm-hmm. the temple. It's, it's everywhere because this is a very powerful symbol, this eight-sided, what, it, what is called the seal of Melchizedek because it represents... The fact that eight, that 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 um, that shape, this octagonal shape, is represents mediation. Okay, so mm-hmm. so when you have an eight-sided tower, an eight-sided physical object, it it denotes this med- this 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 uh, mediation between heaven and earth. Now, who? Well, if earth, if earth is represented by a square, mm-hmm. and heaven is represented by a circle, mm-hmm. then the geometric f- figure that the perfect transition between a square and a circle would be yes 
Exactly. The octagon. Exactly. Which, what does Christ do for us? As one of his titles and roles, and one of the most important is mediator. He mediates for us between the you know the Father and us, and and mm-hmm. symbolically mediates between heaven and earth. He came down. He condescended and became that mediator for us. Yeah. And so, um, in my mind, is this that's kind of what temples are for? Absolutely. <laughs> in fact, Absolutely. I, I want to remind people about the two temples that were the first temples of this dispensation, which were seen in vision by Joseph Smith, mm-hmm. and those temples have the same kind of things that you're talking yes. about here. Yep. If, if you take a look at the Kirtland Temple, the Nauvoo Temple, the, the, the base of the spire is either a, a square or a, or a rectangle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that the top of it is either a, like a ball or a yep. half dome, which is a representation of a circle, basically. Yep. This is earth, this is heaven. heaven. And what's in between it? An eight-sided tower in between. <laughs> the clock tower in Nauvoo is right. an eight-sided octagonal shaped tower that's mediating and Evan. called the Seal of Melchizedek, oh, basically. Melchizedek. But but this is an interesting thing, and and, and a lot, I think probably a lot of members of the church know this. Mm-hmm. But the Melchizedek priesthood was not originally called the Melchizedek priesthood. It was called the priesthood after the holy order of who? The Son of God. Yes. Right? Yep. And if it was from the Son of God, then it, then actually the Melchizedek priesthood is literally the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Yes. And who is the mediator between heaven and earth? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is that seal of Melchizedek, if you will, and he is the mediator. Yep. And this is where some of the beautiful symbolism that you have been able to uh, to share with us has been just mm-hmm. absolutely fabulous, Amberly. Yeah, if you were able to pick one shape that represented the life and mission and purpose of Jesus Christ, you would find it in the octagon. And not only that, but eight, it's eight-sided. Eight represents rebirth. How old are mm-hmm. we when we are baptized? Eight, years old. Eight is yeah. a very significant number when it com- when it comes to rebirth, and so interestingly enough, there's several celestial rooms in our temples um, mm-hmm. that are eight sided. The Boise Temple, its celestial room, yeah. is an octagon. So we ha- we get there, and then oh, so he's got the uh, there's Sila Melchizedek right oh, there. Oh, there we are. There we are. <laughs> Beautiful rendition there. So at that point, uh, if we're true and faithful, and we stay on our path, we don't fall into the filthy waters. Then, then we, get, we, to that, uh, we get to that point, shape. this octagonal shape, and we uh, hopefully can enter in, and it's probably guarded by angels, and mm-hmm. we need to have the, the tokens and the right things to know and say mm-hmm. and the knowledge and wisdom to, to be able to, to uh, pass, pass the, into there. The mm-hmm. sentinels that mm-hmm. guard those yep. places. Yep, and uh, in there. And then it all leads to? Yep, once, once in there, then at that point, um, exaltation. Is that you know can is represented a- after that because of course mm-hmm. here's here's where we you know you can think about the temple and what's what's given there the promises but then I'm being faithful to though those you can then go through that that uh, out the octagon into okay, what's the, connected yeah. for those of those you who are who are listening <laughs> yes. basically there's an octagonal shape and it's connected with like a little narrow a little tunnel neck, way or if you something. will yes. narrow neck of narrow land neck. there we go okay that goes into and a circular a perfect shape circle. perfect circle mm-hmm. and that one has no, no other entrance, entrance or exit and, it's just and no only end. one it's, way in it's and it's an absolute perfect circle mm-hmm. and from you can see it from above i mean it is so yeah. perfectly executed of a circle you know in in mm-hmm. such a large like you said grand scale in space and it's a perfect circle with no exit so being there you've you've reached exaltation and you You're you've there. reached the pinnacle and there you are and so i just picture picture the, the time with these nephites they were able to walk people through the the temple ceremony if you will and the plan of salvation and all of these things in this experience where they're experiencing it physically viscerally visually tactilely they're they're experiencing <laughs> it and and i think it's an also important to realize that the 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 walls are built up high in these so in, you can't see so you can't see because yeah. in a temple you know it's only for those who are initiated those who are prepared and you keep Not it secret. sacred it's you sacred. keep it sacred space it delineates sacred space and and uh what's interesting is this space is known throughout even to this day for all these native american tribes and whatever that this sa- space was was kept sacred and not violated by any tribe for any means or any warfare anywhere. It was a yeah. kind of a, a hands-off zone for everybody that this was known to be sacred and to never be desecrated with war or anything. That's why it still ex- stands and exists like it is today. And it's it's it has an incredible feeling there as well. It's yeah. been it's phenomenal. There's two two other small things yeah. that we want to uh, just address, and that is that when you when so it, if you start again from the beginning, you have a circle mm-hmm. representation of a womb. Yes. Um. It had it comes out to a, uh, a funneling, if you will, mm-hmm. and then, but that funnel doesn't quite connect 
directly to the uh, to the square, which is representation of the earth. There's a there's a juxtaposition mm-hmm. of two funnels that kind of facing each other, mm-hmm. and they don't really quite connect, mm-hmm. which which is representation of basically as we understand it the the veil. Yes, uh, to me it said that there's this veil that you there's a veil right, that, there's... that disconnects us right. from our from our right. pre existence, right. yep. and then we go into the earth, and there's one two three ways to get out of the earth. If you go counterclockwise rotation through that. The, one of them goes up and kind of just has a little dead end place and mm-hmm. doesn't really like it go doesn't really go anywhere. Mm-hmm. The next one goes up and and we don't know exactly what happened. We think that the Raccoon Creek that actually <laughs> used to or runs through that area may have flooded and, and destroyed portions of that. We don't know exactly what happened, but we think there might have been some kind of a connection there um, with this particular little roadway and it goes up and connects to a whole nother uh, a second road, if you will, a second mm-hmm. path. That goes from the the um, the, the Earth, or basically the, the square, over to the octagon, and then there's the third path, which is kind of the more direct route. So, according to our plan of salvation, how many ways out do we have out of this life? Mm-hmm. When we leave this life, basically, we go to when Christ was on the cross. He said uh, to the to the one th- uh, you know thief that was next to him. He said, today that will be with me in paradise, right? Mm-hmm. So we know that paradise is one of those places. What's one of the other places? It's spirit prison. Mm-hmm. For those who have not been that faithful on, in this life or have not really kept their first estate very well, they go to spirit uh, prison. Those are the two main places. So why would there be a third one? Mm-hmm. Well, because of the, <laughs> because of the ideas that... Uh, you're going to make me do this, aren't you? Uh, all right. You're <laughs> okay. doing so well, okay. I'm going to just let you finish. <laughs> anyway, and the third one is basically the direct route for those who have had their work done for them while they're on this earth. Mm-hmm. So they're not just showing up without all the information they need to make it through right. the sentinels. They're going to need to be taught those things. But yep. not only that, somebody else is going to have to do it for them because they didn't do it while they're on the earth. Yep. And so that second route yep. is the vicarious route. Mm-hmm. The main route is for those who have had their work for, done with them and, they, and, they're, and they're showing how they are going past this fil- fountain of filthy water. Mm-hmm. Both of those routes ultimately end up at the seal of Melchizedek. Yep. And then from the seal of Melchizedek, there's only one way in. So what you have here basically is celestial, terrestrial, telestial. You have a pre-existence, yep. which how many religions on the earth even believe in a pre-existence? You have a veil, you have the earth, you have paradise, you have spirit prison, you have a direct route, you have a vicarious route, you both go to the seal of Melchizedek, and then it ultimately is through the seal of Melchizedek, or through Christ. Through the mediator. Through the mediator that we end up going yep. to yep. the sea last and becoming yep. with our yep. Heavenly Father. Now, everything is there, yep. and it's in the right order. Yep. <laughs> Could this just be a wild coincidence? <laughs> you know what? The, the the probability of that just happening by coincidence in a oh. in the largest temple structure it's on the amazing. face of the earth, even today, and what other religion could possibly explain that? No, and and it's and, two thousand years old. Yeah, or yeah, more, more. more. Yes. yes, and what's interesting uh, again for that is like you said, you come in here to this octagon where he mediates for you and it's that's that's the essential part here that's where his role comes in which allows you entrance into that great circle this this heaven but 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 look how big and that's what's interesting mm-hmm. look how big that that great great octagon is it's one of the biggest structures on there yeah. that's his power that's the mercy that's him mediating for you which is so beautiful and it's there's there, in other words there's room for all yeah right just like in the in the podcast that we did with uh, Chauncey Riddle uh, we were talking about how um, when we get to the other side and we come before the judgment bar of God, we're going to be standing there before God the Father, Elohim. Mm-hmm. And who's going to be standing there beside us? The Savior. The Savior. And he, be we, 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 we won't be able to plead for ourselves because we don't have the power because we didn't atone yep. for our own sins. Yep. The only person who can plead for us is Christ. Yep. And so I can imagine what how it will be to have Christ actually standing before God the Father and pleading for you yes. personally. Yes, because He knows your heart like no other, and that's why this room, this place here, is so beautiful. As they lead these people in here and say, "Here is here He is. He yeah. will mediate for you," and then they usher them into this 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 beautiful celestial place. And 
and what a powerful way to teach yeah. that, right? I mean, how beautiful. <laughs> and I want to, as, as an editorial thing, I want to add that yeah. when I looked at this and started to see this, it all started kind of making sense and jumping off. I went to an article written by Noel Reynolds, a great scholar, uh, mm-hmm. who wrote an article, I believe, in a BYU Studies magazine I read years ago, where he laid out what he calls the doctrine of Christ. And mm-hmm. it's a, a six-step, very specific progression, the way that Christ himself lays it out, especially yeah. in Third Nephi. And so I actually took that, overlaid that on this. Oh, really? Yeah, so yeah. I, I really credit Noel Reynolds for how he was able to really uh, specify and, and lay out the doctrine of Christ as written in the text. But when you, it, that's what makes it so profound and so, so real is to see those exact steps in that order, like you said, exactly as it's found. And I want to add one other thing about this that's really interesting too. This, you have to understand, like Rod was saying, it's spread out of how many, how many acres does it? Well, four square miles. Okay. So many, many acres, right? Many, yeah. So it cannot, yes, hundreds. It cannot be seen when you approach the, in we've been there. When you approach these mounds and this, this, you can't, from our perspective as a human we're on eye level we can't can't see see the whole thing which is important because that's how this works when we come here and we're here we can't see it all at once but we can progress through it at each phase which i think is important too but anyway so we cannot see it but guess who can see it all at once if you have from the drone a a drone (laughs) or which they probably didn't have but you know, God himself can see it. And they were building it to him to please yeah. him. And so they used perfection, but they couldn't probably even enjoy their perfection, so to speak, because again, they're always eye level. Yeah. I mean, how I, they're, they're, they're perfect circle. I would love for them even to see how perfectly they this. did it. That's what I'm saying. Yes. They're yeah. building it with our, you know, eye level perspective, but from heaven, it's perfect. And it's so wonderful that they knew and could do this and had the dedication and devotion in years that they, they built this. And by the way, I, I, I have to give a shameless yeah. plug because we have the most beautiful high resolution aerial photography oh. Oh. of this. It's, and, it's, and it's in the, uh, the, it's in the DVD called um, oh. uh, Book of Mormon, let's see, the chronology. Oh. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, visualizing Book of Mormon oh. chronology which is the DVD that has uh, about 40 or 50 of these sites that from oh, high wow. resolution drone video, but that, but especially mm. this site, the Newark Earthworks, is just astounding. astounding. When you look at it. We actually have Im- images from satellites to get you know, directly overhead because mm-hmm. even with the drone, you can't get high enough in elevation mm-hmm. because they have restrictions on how high oh. you can fly the drone. Mm-hmm. You can't get high enough to get the entire thing in an image. And then tell you go to satellite level. Wow. Because it's four miles yes. <laughs> that you're trying to shoot. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you'd have to be, you know, a long ways up to get yeah. that that kind of a yeah. shot. So, so just, there, that, there you go. A testament to I, I hope devotion. you're enjoying. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, uh, yeah. this, is, this is some of the meat that we talk about, you know, in the, in the, in the, you know, the milk and the meat. Yeah, well, this is, this is, um, this is it. Pretty, yeah. pretty heavy duty pretty, stuff. Pretty good stuff. Our, All right. So let's our go. Our Nephites the... knew, knew what they were doing and they, and they did it well. <laughs> and it was, it's amazing. All right. So now we're going to, we're going to uh, drop over here to page 327 of the annotated edition of the Book of Mormon. This is going to, a little bit about, uh, this land, another another um, mm. uh, item that you didn't mention yet, and I think you were holding off no, until that's right. until you until we were going to get to this. Yep. But um, there's something else beyond corn, wheat, and barley. Yes. That may give us some indications as to geography. Yes. And, and it's climate good. and things like mm-hmm. that. So, would you like to tell us a little bit more about uh, this this yes. particular fruit? We, Rod is talking about grapes, <laughs> grapes, and they are absolutely great. Gra- they're great. Great grapes. <laughs> grapes are great. They are essential, essential to the law of Moses, but it gets even deeper than that. And we'll talk about that. But uh, they are used throughout in the different, for example, in Feast of Tabernacles, uh, wine, grape wine is used on libations, which is it's poured out at a certain point in the ceremony. Um, they're used in the daily offerings. Wait a minute, are you saying that the Nephites had wine? <laughs> well, uh, King Noah sure had a, a, an abundance <laughs> of it, didn't he? He was very fond of wine, and uh, the Nephites occasionally used it to get the Lamanites. They, drunk. it was useful. So. It, it comes up in, in many points in the narrative, so it's very, very abundantly yeah. clear that it was there. And we know that they grew it because here we find in Mosiah eleven fifteen, it came to pass that King Noah planted vineyards round about in the land, and he built wine presses and made wine in abundance, and there. Therefore, he became a wine bibber and also his people. 
So they loved their vino, okay? But that tells us <laughs> that tells us that they had you, an abundance. You sure they're not from yeah. Italy? <laughs> <laughs> they had it in abundance. They could grow it. They could cultivate it and all of that wonderful things. Well, if you've ever driven up through the heartland of Ohio, you will see it looks like Napa Valley. Yeah. It is the most gorgeous display of vineyards you will ever see, probably outside of of California in, the, in that area. But um, the point being, the climate is perfect, perfect for growing these grapes. Yeah. And a problem that is found down south in, in Mesoamerica is that that climate is not conducive to it. There was a a form of kind of a wild grape in, a, in an herb form was that was kind of, kind of a found nasty thing. It anciently. Was, it was very, very rare. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't. Yeah. It's not what we're talking here. And these were grown in abundance. And, and what is important about that is we know that they're there in the, in the record because when the Vikings showed up in 1000 AD, they were stunned by the, not only the abundance of the grapes, but there were several, at least three different kinds. Mm -hmm. So much so that they actually nicknamed it Vinland. Wineland. What does that mean? Yeah. Vin, vin, vine. Vin, vine, wine. Yeah. Vinland, yeah. Vineland. And so um, the land of the vines or land of wine. And um, so they, and they documented at least three different types of grapes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and this is found, the I document this. There's the fox grape and then there's two other kinds yeah. that make just wonderful wine. Yeah, red, from red, kind of the bluish color what and, they, and kind of mm -hmm. a, a, a greenish mm -hmm. grape. Yeah, and yeah. so yeah, they we learn in some of these books that I studied uh, about the, the Western Vikings and or the Westward Vikings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and I document it, but that uh, that that was there when they, yeah. where, when where, they where, where is that documented again? That's in the uh, so uh, it's in uh, a book called in, the Western in, Vikings. But oh yes, that, that's it's in, also in, this in both one, of these. In both mm -hmm. of these, yeah, talking about yep. the wine and so forth. Yep, there. yep, yes. yep. Um, and that they were they 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 said themselves that it was called Vinland for the reason that grapevines grow there by themselves producing the best wine. <laughs> so this came from those who found it there in 1080. Yeah. So it was there. Now, now also, this is this, this is on page uh, 327, because if you take a look at the little gold bar here in the annotated edition of the Book of Mormon on page 326, this is from Alma chapter 55, and this is verse 8. It says, and when it was evening, this, this is, this I, I kind of alluded to this already, but yes. uh, basically this yep. is a little escape uh, you know, a situation here by the Nephites. Here. Yep. Yeah, and when it was evening, Laman went to the guards who were over the Nephites, and behold, they saw him coming, and they hailed him. But he said unto them, Fear not, behold, I am a Lamanite. Behold, we have escaped from the Nephites, and they sleep. And behold, we have taken of their wine and brought with us. Yes. So whose wine was it? The, the Nephites, Nephites wine. wine. And yeah. what did they do with it? They got the Lamanite guards drunk. drunk, and then they put them to sleep. Got uh, yeah, got and out they, of there. And then they were able to. Well, go. But but not only that, what did they do? Remember that they gathered. I think this this is the one that they gathered their flocks and their herds together. Oh yes, yep. And that then twice they, they did that. So they had yes. to get them very good and twice. drunk because mm -hmm. flocks and herds are not exactly yes. quiet animals. No. I mean, they brrr, you're making brrr. an escape. It's it's pretty hard to do it quietly with a, a flock of sheep. But <laughs> they so this wine had to be very very effective in <laughs> keeping them asleep stuff. for a very long time. It was the good stuff. Yes, and so there's that. But I almost think the most compelling. <laughs> uh, use or I example of the importance of wine yeah. in the Book of Mormon is Christ himself in 3rd Nephi when he yeah. shows up and he gives them the sacrament and to do that he did it twice two days in a row both days he one day and then he did it the next day and on the first day he asked that the disciples that they would bring some bread and wine unto him so he asked the Nephites there in 3rd Nephi, bring me some bread and some wine. And he broke it and blessed it and mm -hmm. administered the sacrament to them. Mm -hmm. On day two, this is what's interesting. He produced his own. Oh, kind of like uh, over in the old world. Yep. So point being is they had it mm -hmm. there for sure, but then he produced his own that next day and he said he said these words he commanded his disciples that they should take of the wine of the cup and drink of it and that they should give also give unto the multitude that they might drink of it he's commanding them this is on this is on day one when they went with their wine mm -hmm. so just to make sure by, they by the way that was that's the third nephi chapter 18 Eight. uh, verses one yep. and two and then verse eight yes and so he's as he's you know administering the sacrament and in what I can only imagine was the most amazing, wow. <laughs> incredible, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, oh, can you imagine? And yeah. that he's commanding them to drink of this wine that they brought him. 
So as he's representing his blood as a part of, of his supernal sacrifice and what that represents, the blood that was so costly that he shed from every pore, and he likens that and uses wine to represent that to these people. Mm-hmm. Is wine and grapes important? Are they there? Would they be there in abundance? How important is that for them to yeah. have? And also even, I mean, I know that uh, we've even talked about, or you've talked about before, just even the preparation, how mm-hmm. they prepare the wine, how they take the grapes, mm-hmm. how they put them into a vat. Yes. They, they, they have a washing of the feet. Mm-hmm which is very interesting and symbolic mm-hmm. in and of itself. Yes. And then they get into the wine vat or the grape vat, basically, and they stomp those grapes. Mm-hmm. They stomp them and stomp them and stomp them. And I know this is some of the symbolism that is just so beautiful that you've told about. Would you like to tell us a little bit well, more about remember, that? Well, and remember, because he's talking about, in talking about his sacrifice and what, what happened there, and he talked about how he trod the wine press alone. He, he trod the wine press. And so when you look at a wine press and you realize what's happening and like what you described. And it's crushing it's the grapes. It's crushing grape. and stomping and crushing. And then and they're crushed down and then they're, and then they're, they're pressed again. And it's, it's, it's just a, it's an amazing experience what they do to get this wine and, and to get this juice, of course, but that, that also comes to wine. stained. Yes, and then they get, of course. Depends, depending on the kind of grape it is. Right. But, but generally speaking, mm-hmm. when they make uh, like red wines and mm-hmm. so forth, their feet will literally mm-hmm. get stained. Yes. A bright red color. It looks like they're yes. bleeding. Yes, yes, like uh, profusely, yeah. absolutely. And so that that in itself is so so visually profound to, to even imagine. But but yeah, this 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 pressing of the wine is so. This wine press is so interesting. And and when we talk about the grapes of wrath, his wrath, and you know in uh, you know with uh, some of those hymns, and it points to this. And and how uh, how could we pre- present some kind of substitute? in that situation how how if we're not in north america where we have these grapes how do then we we think of oh, but, but you but you said so that the, the, Maya, the mayans did have some kind of a, a substitute well remember? they had an alcoholic drink that yeah. wasn't wine it's it, theirs but, but, was the early precursor for tequila which was an agave drink yeah, which is called, now what's uh, modern day tequila is made from but it was came from these agave plants which was like, like polk or something uh, yes it was called polk p-u-l K U E and and they got it from these these giant huge. these huge um, uh, agave, plants. agave mm-hmm. plants that look like overgrown aloe vera basically and <laughs> yeah. and so they they could make yes it, they're they're huge and <laughs> then they could make this this uh, kind of frothy uh, alcoholic beverage yeah. that they would drink and party with etc. Some of, of the they could make it into a foam yes they kind of foamed it kind of snort it right mm-hmm. yep and so you know you see some of those graphics that you see down there in Mesoamerica you know portraying this Actually doing this doing yeah. this yeah but Interestingly enough, you never see this wine, this, yes. what we're talking about going on. This, this Polk stuff is happening a lot, but, yeah. but this is what's important. So. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that that, yeah. that, that gives us a, some yeah. good background. I mean, there's a lot yep. more to this. Yep. Uh, that I know that Amber is. Yeah, would these be, are, we're just, we're just we're touching <laughs> on surfaces. If you want to go deep, you know, it's, it's deeper, it's there. deeper, should, yeah, deeper. deeper. It's there. Yeah. Okay. The last, yeah. last thing we're going to talk yeah. about here is uh, with Amberly is. From uh, if, if you have the annotated edition of the Book of Mormon, it's page 385. And on page 385, um, it's talking about this, but this is actually going into page 384, which is 3rd Nephi, mm. chapter 3, mm-hmm. or excuse me, chapter 4, and this is um, verse 7. So this is 3rd uh, Nephi, chapter 4, verse 7. It says, And it came to pass that they did come up to battle, and it was in the sixth month. And behold, great and terrible was the day that they did come up to battle. And they were girded about after the manner of robbers. Who are these people? Gadiantans. The Gadiantans. And they had a lamb skin about their loins. And they were dyed in blood. And their heads were shorn, and they had head plates upon them. And great and terrible was the appearance of the armies of Gedeonhai because of their armor and because of their being dyed in blood. Hmm. Let's talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this, this is needy because this right there tells us a gives us a lot of information that's very relevant not just to then but to now so just no, to so set up the time frame that we, that they didn't mention at the beginning they said they, that they talked about asses and horses and goats and ox and cows and so mm-hmm. forth but they didn't mention specifically sheep in the very early part of it mm-hmm. but yet throughout the book of Mormon they talk about having flocks and herds of what yeah. and yes you got to tell us about yeah. the sheep so yes yeah, so um very, very, very instructive this verse is. It tells us a lot about who the Gadiantans were, what they were doing, and in the time frame they were doing it, which is very interesting that this 
event happened just eight years before, before Christ the Savior comes. came. Yeah. So eight years. I believe this is also because the Book of Mormon is such a warning and irrelevant commentary and warning about our day that we need to pay attention to when things happen. Exactly. In the scheme of this. So right before the Savior comes, we're having this this event here with these with this great and terrible day with with the with the uh, with the Gadiantans. What is interesting about this is first of all the sheer number of lambs that were available to them and that's very important because when you there read were, there were a lot of people there were a lot of gadiantans. yes well if we read in a couple of verses later mm -hmm. when the nephites start to when once they repent and the lord puts his protection around this is we're talking about laconius's people right there was a the siege shield. going on yeah. so laconius had gathered the lord had told him to gather his people together and and to uh the the land. prevent against this to the, this in the center of the land because the mm -hmm. siege of the gadiantans and so um we know numbers of gadiantans because as the, the, as the Laconius' people repented and received the protection of the Lord, then they were sustained and protected to the point that the, the, the Nephites then were able to go out and slay the Gadiantans by, the, and the word is thousands, yea, tens of thousands. So we're we talking know a lot of people. we're talking about a lot of people who are wearing a lot of lambskins. So the first thing we need we pull from that is just very obvious that lambskins were very abundant and lambs were everywhere mm -hmm. and, and for, to be able to provide this kind of loin but, but, but why, let's, why would they have so many lambs right because see because the lambs are so you know essential to the law of moses but they uh needed them they grew them you know they they were so central to all of this but here's what's interesting about this yes. uh, go, go ahead if you were going to say i was just going to say i mean they couldn't repent oh exactly I without that. right right Yep. So, so they were not. They, it wasn't just like they were growing them because oh, they were going to have, you know, some lamb chops. Them. Right, right, okay. right. No, these were not for lamb chops. No, <laughs> no, no. Growing right. Them so that they could rid themselves of their own yes, sins. Yes. Yes. And it wasn't just once a year. We talked about it on Passover, but actually, right, right. these offerings were daily. And and in fact, in yes. Israel, we know that a lamb was sacrificed morning and night, every day. Not, not, not for everybody, but that that was part of it. So yes, an abundance of lambs were needed for that exact point. Yeah. They became the symbol of repentance and forgiveness and so, sacrifice. So, so, what do you think the reason was that the that the Gadiantans decided that their that their uh, costume of choice? Yes. <laughs> is a, I mean, of all the things that they could right. wear, I mean, why not make it a uh, a, a buffalo skin, or a uh, or, or a deer skin, or a, a beaver pelt? Or, you know, something like or that. Or a skunk. I mean, that would, a black and white would be very attractive, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, and be very indicative of who they were, yeah, or right? Mink. Um, mink. You know, yes, or me. Be yes. more comfortable, probably. Right. Well, that's what you need to understand. And, and uh, Matthew Brown and Daniel Peterson wrote very good articles in, in literature about this. It was very instructive in my research to understand this because you have to understand why they, why they did pick that and where that came from. Well, you trace that back all the way back to Adam. When he, the Lord made skins of Adam, made skins for the, for Adam and Eve of covering, and it was believed that they were lamb skins. Yeah, because by, the, by the way, they weren't cloth; they were skins. skins. They, in other words, yes. someone had to kill something. Yes. Who did yes. the killing? That represented that first sacrifice there after Eden, where they were yeah. shown, "This is what's going to happen, yeah. and this is the lamb, and this is who he is," and and it started to all be shown to them. So lamb skins have always been indicative uh, of that going all the way back to to, to eat to the very beginning. garden yes and so what happened why they picked these and and daniel peterson talks about the gadiantans the other thing we need to understand about them is yes they were robbers but we need to understand they were a very organized group of what he called the alternative church okay mm -hmm. because remember when look when gideon High writes his epistle to laconius in his bold and brazen way and join us and why do you think you can stand against us and we're you know we're great and we're numerous and everything and and he was literally the governor he named himself the governor these people were organized yes. they weren't just loose bands of savages they were an organized alternative church yeah. that's instructive and so having said that they had usurped the sacred garments symbolism. the symbolism and the symbols of these to as kind of a look we have the legitimate power look at us like yeah. we have the sacred garments we're the good guys in fact in his epistle he makes the point we're the good guys yeah. and as proof they they bandied around in bandied about in their in their 
lambskins, their aprons, if you will. Yeah. And when you trace back the importance of a lambs lambskin apron, we see that all of the major prophets, from Isaiah on down, even John the Baptist was described as having a, an apron of lambskin. It, it's suggested in some of the other literature that, that Jesus, when he was uh, washing the feet of his disciples, he had his apron on of lambskin. Mm. It's very, very symbolic, points directly to him and his sacrifice. So they're using it as in a, they, they co-opted it, they hijacked it, as to say, no, we're also, the legitimate people. But also at the same time, as they're as they making this statement that they're the legitimate people, mm -hmm. guess what else? They're denying the Nephites from the ability to offer sacrifices. Yep because they're basically killing off all of their sheep, so they can't mm -hmm. even offer sacrifices anymore, so they cannot even live their religion, well, they're denying them. Except luckily, and that would be true, except if you kind of remember back in the story, the Lord told Laconius when he, to gather, when he had him gather in the center of the yeah, land, right, right. So he actually had, told him to kick seven years seven worth years. of their stuff for that very purpose. So so that's a good point. So to kind of be able to keep doing this, that's how important it was. So in a siege, you yeah, know, when you think about what you're gathering, know no, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. They're thinking, yeah. oh, we're gonna, yes. We're gonna keep them mm -hmm. from even practicing the religion, just yes. like the pharaohs were doing exactly. with the Egyptians. Exactly, kind of mocking them. Mm -hmm. And so interestingly enough, another thing that comes out of that, of, of Daniel Peterson's article, which is so great, was he talks about the genesis, basically, of the Gadiantans, hundreds of years previous to this, hundreds of years, goes all the way back to Alma's time, because he's saying, he, in his explanation, which I think is brilliant, that remember Amulon, when they escaped, he being the head of the wicked priests of King Noah, mm -hmm. um, King Noah's father, Zenith, was a righteous, good king and man and would have had the knowledge of these things, including this understanding of symbolism, sacred clothing, that kind of thing. And so King Noah would have inherited that from his father. And apparently in his wine bibbing yeah. days, or at some point he goes off the rails and decides to be, you know, become what he became, King Noah, which eventually brought on his own death, <laughs> prophesied by Abinadi. But the point is, is in the meantime, they had access to this holy sacred knowledge and truth as these wicked priests who, you know, when they escaped, as cowards did up into the mountains, yeah. and they burned uh, um, King Noah, but then these priests escaped. Yeah. And what did they do? The first thing they did, instead of going back to their wives and children and being honorable they went men, and found they the went and found the 24 Lamanite princesses mm -hmm. and took them and forced them to marry them. Mm -hmm. And, but what Peterson points out, which I think is, like I said, so brilliant, is that was the actual start of the Gadiantans. And they just survived throughout the, you know, the how many hundred years and were the, the bane of the Nephites' existence because he, they literally legitimately had claim to the truth at one point. And, the, and they were the priests in the temple, basically, That's right. with, with King Noah. Right. He, he was, right. They, they were right. part of his court. Right. Probably had been part of his father, King Zenith's court, who, uh, again, King Zenith, remember, was good and righteous. Right. Noah was the one that went off. So the, who, who knows how long these priests had been there, what they knew, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe that's why Alma did respond to the truth when he heard it. Who knows? But the point being is, so Alma, you know, makes Please. his way and starts, you know, baptizing in the church. But... But then we've got these wicked priests that have this knowledge, have this, these, these likely have these lambskins. And that becomes their little, in their, you know, their secret combinations and whatnot. This is passed down and this is why we're legitimate. And we have legitimate claim to the truth and we have the holy garments or however they want to say it. But so hundreds of years later now here in third Nephi, they're bold in writing letters and epistles. We are who we are. And, and that's why. And so it's really interesting to look at that. And so again, to, to take this out of, this event, this this amazing incident, and take it and put it in another location where lambs have never been found been. anciently, have yeah. never been. There's no evidence whatsoever. So, so is there evidence here in North America? I mean, yes. Yes, I mean, there is. Overall. That was, in fact, that was probably <laughs> my biggest piece. I thought if I, I absolutely have to find archaeological evidence for for these lambs because, to me, along with the barley, I keep saying smoking gun, but they're they're kind of my other smoking gun, if yeah. you will. Yeah. And so, I as I searched and poured through the research, I came across a book by a man named William Ritchie, and he was a just the preeminent archaeologist of yeah. New York back in the 1950s and you know, a, a brilliant scientist, and he wrote a book called The Archaeology of New York. Yeah. And he detailed all of his findings and where they were found and in great detail. And in Kip Island, New York, western New York, right at the base of, by the way, right at the base of Hill Cumorah, <laughs> he found evidence of domestic sheep. Domestic sheep, yes. Yes, and, uh -huh, and they were able to date the bones, of course. And what they found was that uh, they were dated about 100 AD. So we know that sheep were raised in that area in western New York. 
-hmm. in around 100 AD, and we have the bones to prove it. And by the way, the images that you can see on page 385 in the, in the, in the book here, uh, these are, are stone engravings. Basically, these are, these are little stone, kind of like amulets, if you will. Um, and they are, are, you know, to us, it looks very much like sheep. So we have some pictures of, of, uh, of sheep and, with, and, and different profiles. And then these, uh, these, these uh, rocks, basically, that have been carved to look like, essentially, a, a sheep. And these are in, uh, in, in several different, uh, mm -hmm. not, not just yeah. one or two, but in, mm -hmm. in several different uh, museums mm -hmm. back in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So we know that they had sheep. The, another, another great indication is that the uh, Hopewell uh, Culture Nat National Historical Site in uh, Chillicothe, Ohio, mm -hmm. they actually, there is a, a copper oh, yep. goat horn. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, obviously they must have known what a goat was. They must have known what a goat horn was because they made a, a, one made out of copper that looks yep. just like a goat horn. Yes. So uh, these ancient people, they definitely knew what, what uh, sheep were and goats and, um, and so forth. And so that gives us some, some credibility mm -hmm. as far as the Book of Mormon is concerned yep. that the, an, the animals and plants of the Book of Mormon are not, they, they have not been misnamed. No. They, uh, they are exactly what the Lord, I think the Lord knows what a horse is. <laughs> and I think the Lord knows what a sheep is. And, yes. I, think, and I don't think that, they, uh, that he's got those mixed up. Yes. And I want to add too that in the Book of Mormon, you're not just going to find reference to sheep in this incident. It's just the where they're most numerous. But you're going to find reference to sheep throughout. Now, let me explain a little bit about that because Moroni talks, and when he was talking about an analogy, he talked about um, uh, being around, uh, like a, they were um, talking about uh, sheep and lambs and being innocent like lambs, and they were used as metaphors and different things throughout. But yeah. Alma 5, I do a whole presentation on that yeah, called that wolves, and, awesome. wolves and Sheep's Clothing, and that really goes into this, this aspect of the Gadiatans and wolves, or in sheep, but also the importance of the fact that Alma 5 sermon, that great sermon, is about the great shepherd and his flock and his sheep, and he's talking about us. And then he goes on to warn the people in that great sermon in Alma 5, that against, to warn them of the wolf, and that the wolf sought, mm -hmm. seeks always to devour the sheep. the sheep. Now what's interesting about wolves is another, that's another animal, and I don't even talk about it in this book, but in this I do. <laughs> yeah. Wolves are uh, indigenous to North America, and they are never, uh -huh. they've never been found in Mesoamerica, but they are a North American animal, and I talk more about that in detail. But the point being is the when- fact that they use that metaphor yes, as wolves yes, in sheep's clothing. Yes. And obviously, they, A, A, knew what wolves were. They knew what and, wolves were. <laughs> and he was warning, and he was giving them such a, such a warning that they could completely understand and, you know, and, and, and uh, comprehend because they lived amongst, the, amongst them. And then at some point, he stops kind of mid- sermon and then kind of looks out and directs his message to the shepherds that were there in his audience he goes now i'm going to look at you shepherds and and talk to you because you know what i'm talking about so now he's directing his message at shepherds now again what's interesting about that so now he's talking about sheep and lambs and shepherds and wolves and 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 how to how to become into his fold in the fold of the great shepherd and the good shepherd and what that means and he's very very specific about if you're not of the good shepherd's fold then you are of the devils mm -hmm. he's very very clear cut on that but the point is is he's directing this message at the people who would totally understand and and be able to assimilate these ideas of sheep and wolves because they lived amongst them if you're going to teach and warn a people and spend all those pages and time on this sermon that he said came directly from God after fasting and praying much and it was all in the energy of his soul that the Lord gave him exactly what to say, those words are going to be so inspired directly from the Lord. You're going to use things and those words that and animals that those people could understand. It was a warning. Mm -hmm. And a warning loses its, its, efficacy, if it's, its effect <laughs> if you are well, if saying something that... If These people have never seen. If you're from North America and somebody's saying, watch out for those Tasmanian devils. Right. Or the unicorns. Those, those, those unicorns. you got to watch out watch for them out for because, them. you know, but you're never going to experience them. So, so it means how, nothing. It zero meaning. That's right. But, so there, he, but there's even more to that. In fact, you make one of the most beautiful and, uh, and, and impassioned, I don't know what, to, what even the best word to call it, but basically um, with a, to, to get, have an understanding of the significance of these sheep. And how they would be utterly meaningless yep. if they didn't have sheep. Number one, if they didn't have access to these sheep, 
and all of the other things that go along with the laws of Moses and 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 what that means to uh, to these different prophets in the Book of Mormon. Yes, Martin. well, and that's a great way to kind of bring this full circle and wrap this up yeah. and, and kind of bring this all perfectly together in the fact that not only, like I was alluding to earlier, were sheep used as you know in specific, practical, pragmatic ways and in, in references to, but more importantly, and this is probably one of the most important aspects of this whole work, is that it, I, I put the number of verses I can't remember, but it's in my presentation here of how many verses that the prophets, whether it be Alma, Moroni, Mormon, Nephi, they talk about the importance of being washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. That was always this phrase that directed straight to him, to Jesus Christ, to his to Gethsemane, to his atonement, to the blood that he shed, and that the way that we are made clean is in the blood of the lamb. And then he'd say, wash your garments in the blood of the lamb. Make them white in the blood of the lamb throughout the whole book. Now, how important is understanding a lamb and the blood that, that he's talking about? And how beautiful of, uh, of a metaphor and the imagery that comes to mind when, he, when, when our, those prophets were begging the people to wash their, 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 to have their garments made white in the blood of the lamb. Mm -hmm. and to be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And that's, to me, the most uh, compelling part of understanding yeah. Yeah. the Lamb's position and place in this book. Yeah. Because that is, our, that is our key. That's the way to understand Him and what He did for us. Yeah. So. That, is, that is wonderful. The, you know, the, um, and I kinda, I'm not sure if I should even want to bring this up, but the alternative to sheep mm -hmm. in the Mesoamerican setting has been said to be an alpaca or an agouti, mm -hmm. both of which are basically rats or rodents. rodents. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, if if that was the alternative, um, I mean, you know, I guess number one is does the Lord really accept alternatives? Mm -hmm. And uh, and 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 if He does, is a rat a acceptable accept a one? <laughs> alternative to a lamb? Oh. Well, <laughs> that that one hurts a little bit because because it, yeah. So uh, as I've alluded to earlier, uh, what has been problematic in uh, Book of Mormon location and in geography for some of the other models is because they've never had any evidence of sheep being able to be raised there, especially due to climate. We're talking wool and mm -hmm. you know sheep, you know Scotland, and you know you think of cold and cold you, you need you need you need yeah. some colder yeah. climates. They don't do well in rainforests. But anyway, so when you have uh, when you have you're putting a location anywhere that that does not produce evidence that sheep were ever there and, and, and lambs, uh, you have a problem. And so um, to address that, some scholars in it, that are pro uh, the proponents of other geographical lo locations have mm -hmm. suggested that um, because they weren't there and and they weren't and they're they're acknowledging, yeah, um, you know, we we don't have the sheep and the lambs here. Yeah, there's, there's no but, frescoes. There's no evidence. There's no bones. Got, yeah, we're looking for for bone. To, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's just there's just nothing, and so therefore they've had to produce uh, what one scholar has called Can candidate animals. apples, <laughs> yeah, animals, candidate that animals that were and on the scene that yeah, were available, yeah. so that they could say, well, when the Lord said lambs. Actually, uh, this is what he meant because they had to go with what's available there in Mesoamerica. And the, the closest thing they could find were two versions of a guinea pig, both being rodents. One was called an agouti and one was an alpaca. And they were basically a 10-pound guinea pig and then about a 20-pound guinea pig. But a couple things that come to mind there. First of all, rodents are expressly <laughs> forbidden in, in the Law of Moses to start with. So these people would not, unclean. would not only not touch them, they wouldn't eat them, they wouldn't have nothing to do with... A rodent. And if they did, they would have to go through a, 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 a lengthy a cleansing, cleansing you know, whole thing. Right. And, okay, so just off the top there, there that, that excludes it. But then you go deeper and you start looking at the symbolic levels. Well, are those agoutis and alpacas, uh, are they, or alpacas, not alpacas, pacas, P-A-C-A. Are they white? Are they uh, spotless? Are they one male, you know, a one-year-old male, you know, animals that are white and spotless? No. That's just as important to the symbology as almost anything. This mm -hmm. this idea of this young male white spotless lamb, and then you you know they want to present a, a, a brown mottled looking spotted mm -hmm. guinea pig that's a rodent and say, well, we didn't have these, so surely they just substituted with these. Yeah. And that's just a really hard pill for me to swallow because 
It doesn't make sense on a law of Moses level, on a symbolic level. Well, it, and it didn't go so well for Cain. No, <laughs> you know, when the Lord, when the Lord, no, that did not go well. When he specifies what is to be sacrificed and why, he has a reason for it. Yes. And I don't think he, he suffers uh, substitutes very well. Yes. Uh, we, we can see that throughout the, the record in, in the New Testament and Old Testament. But, but the point being is um, it's hard for me to believe that, uh, that the Lord would take these people there and say, oh, you know, you're not going to find lambs, but that's okay because, oh, you've got these rodents, but oh, well, they actually violate the very law I wrote. So we're kind of in a conundrum here, people. <laughs> you know, I just, that's just not how I see it going down. Uh, I'm being a little dramatic there. But um, having said that, I see went up here in North America that... Well, the thing is that they would, have to, they would have to actually have a lot of substitutes because they'd have to substitute for wheat. They would have to substitute barley. for barley. They would have to substitute for grapes. They would have yeah. to use the, the, the foamy uh, agave plant stuff Folk. instead of actually mm-hmm. um, having grapes. They'd have to substitute for sheep. They had, they had no cows or, or oxen, which are also used as substitutes, or goats. Right. Which, by the way, were also used as as, as these things. Yep. So basically, they have to substitute every right. single thing except right. for palm leaves yep. in order to live the law of Moses. And the seven-day calendar, why, too. Why would God lead a covenant people to a promised land that was completely devoid of, of every single thing except for one that they needed to have and they were commanded to live? Commanded. And then send them to that place. Yes. And not only were they commanded to, I got to go to Jacob because I, I, it wasn't just this one way, here's the commands, I'm a harsh God, and this is it. It was a gift to them. And Jacob, yeah. Jacob articulates this better than anybody in the most beautiful way, and I just encourage anybody to read that, that Jacob, in fact, can we go to that? Because I feel like that's a great, a great place to end and a great place to wrap this up because it is so beautiful. The way he describes and articulates the purpose and the, and the meaning and connection that they personally had to the law of Moses is, is just profound, and I, it's just really worth reading. And, and he says this, um, let's see, it's, um, he, let's see, I'm just going to, I have it marked here if I can just find it, um, right here, I believe it's Jacob 4, uh, 4, 7, I believe. Okay, here it is, yep, Jacob 4. Okay, so this starts in uh, Jacob 4, chapter 4. And if I could just read these verses, they're, they're, they're powerful and, and worth hearing. For, for this intent have we written these things, that they may know that we knew of Christ, and we had a hope of his glory many hundred years before his coming. And not only we ourselves had a hope of his glory, but also all the holy prophets, with, prophets which were before us. Behold, they believed in Christ and worshiped the Father in his name, and also we worship the Father in his name. And for this intent, we keep the law of Moses, it pointing our souls to him. And for this cause, it is sanctified unto us for righteousness, even as it was accounted unto Abraham in the wilderness, to be obedient unto the commands of God, and offering up his son Isaac, which is a similitude of God and his only begotten son. Wherefore, we search the prophets, and we have many revelations in the spirit of prophecy. And having all these witnesses, we obtain a hope, and our faith become, tr- becometh unshaken, insomuch that we truly command in the name of Jesus, and the very trees obey us, or the mountains, or the waves of the sea. So he goes on to talk about more about that, and it's beautiful, and I suggest they all read it, read it all. But the point being here is it pointing our souls to him. And he talks a little bit more and kind of talks about it being they delighting in it. But... But they loved it because it was their connection to him. And so they were, they were happy to live it. And they were grateful he provided a way for them to live it. And they gave him thanks for that. And it kept them yes. pointing yes. their lives and their, and their thoughts and their, yes. and their hopes and their desires toward him. Toward him. For a thousand years. Yes, to the point that it, their faith was so strong in this, in, in, in how the way that it pointed to them that he said the mountains would move. I mean, you heard Jacob. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of faith that they were able to cultivate and nurture and maintain based on their keeping and understanding of this law. Mm-hmm. Now, is that not a gift? It, it, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a prison sentence. It's a gift. <laughs> and when they have that gift, they're so grateful to live it and have everything they need. Because God is an abundant, loving, omniscient God. And that's what we find in this book. And the evidence bears it out. And we have physical, actual evidence right here in North America 
that yeah. speaks to every one of these things and says these people were here, their lambs were here, their temples were here, and here they are. And we have their, their, the evidence that they had all of these things and yes. that they also understood the very plan of salvation, yep. which is which is the the the, the underlying foundation between, be, behind the whole thing. The whole thing. So this is just beautiful, Amberly. Listen, I just wanted yeah. to thank you for uh, for dropping in and yeah. and uh, and coming in and uh, letting us have this uh, opportunity to, sh- to have you share some of this amazing research that you've spent uh, years in accumulating, and uh, and you're getting it to basically very refined <laughs> and 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 and. and you know, kind of uh, filtered down to the just the most precious nuggets, and I hope that uh, our audience out there will will appreciate the fact that um, that that there has been a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that have gone into this, <laughs> and uh, we appreciate that yes. very much. And uh, and and uh, thank you everybody for joining us. I hope you'll again join us for uh, our our next uh, podcast here. Uh, we also want to uh, just take a, just a, just a second and thank uh, Mike and Nancy James and uh, and Latter Day Media for uh, putting all these things together for us and uh, and helping us to uh, to have uh, the availability to be able to bring this to you. Um, just as a as a closing thing, can I hand me yes, your, yeah. your DVD? So the DVD is basically here. If you'd like to learn more about uh, this information. Um, We've covered about, you know, we've only covered, had a couple of hours here. To, about 10%. To, together. So, yeah, about 10%. So if you want to get really into uh, some information, it's Jehovah's Holy Days in the Heartland of North America. Um, then this is the second one that you did, which is called Five Scriptures that Validate the Heartland Model for the Location of the Book of Mormon. Phenomenal. I, 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 I mean, I love them all, but, I mean, this is a personal case. I like that one. And The Wolves in Sheep's Clothing. And uh, that one is really, very, is very powerful. Uh, if you'd like to, if you'd like to see these, you can get these from our bookstore. But you can also, um, you know, we'll be uh, streaming, uh, right? be streaming uh, a lot of Amberly's other presentations. These are just three mm-hmm. out of a like dozen yeah. Yeah, presentations that she has done, and uh, we don't have them all up yet. So be patient with us. But uh, but we're going to have uh, as many as we can get up of Amberly's uh, research, and you can yeah. go and you can. Um, like eight bucks a month or something, you can nice. you can access all of these things, and oh. then a portion of that will go to her to be able to help her to be able to continue her uh, ongoing research nice. into this area, so we can bring forth the evidences of the Book of Mormon, like Elder Holland said in his uh, in his now hopefully famous talk. <laughs> Those of you who are familiar with this podcast have heard that part, um, where he said that you know that that we need to be bringing forth the evidences of the keystone of our religion, even the Book of Mormon. Yeah. And if I can just add one more thing uh, to what Rod, th- and thank you for, for having me on, um, but that I hope if you've got nothing else tonight out of, out of this or anything I've said, <laughs> you've maybe just caught a glimpse of, of my passion or my, my love of this, because it goes right back to President Benson quote that we started with, which is the power that comes in to your life and just illuminates every part of your life and blesses every part of your life. And I, I, again, I get to say that, that, that it has, and you can kind of see it in the passion of my work because truth is truth is truth. And it, it liberates our souls and it, it, it enlightens us and it enlivens us and it gives us hope. And what, what could you want more than that? And it's found right here in this book. So I just would say, go back, you know, President Benson, uh, he's read on, right on. There's power in this book and it comes into your life. Well said. Thank you, Amberly. Good night, folks. Good night. Thank you for listening to the Book of Mormon Evidence podcast. If you like this Come Follow Me supplemental study, click the like button and share it with your friends. Be sure to go to bookofmormonevidence.org, which is a hub with all the links that you would like to the podcasts, to upcoming events, the store, 200 plus answers about the Book of Mormon, as well as links to our streaming site, which now has over 100 new videos from our virtual expo. If you want to see the expo, go to comefollowme2020.org. And you can also see them on the streaming site, bookofmormonevidencestreaming.com.